Hi, I'm Alex, and this is the movie Oppenheimer. 250,000 people were killed by a talented scientist's new invention. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. And the world is not prepared. The movie, based on true events, begins with Robert Oppenheimer having a vision of an atomic explosion. He is at a safety hearing and reads his address to the commission, which states the need to view the case through the lens of his life and work. The commissioners wonder why the scientist left the United States. Is it not possible to study physics only in Europe? In 1926, young Oppenheimer studied in Cambridge with the outstanding physicist Patrick Blackett. However, the arrogance of the teacher and personal dislike prompts the student to poison his apple, but not with the toxin of fear, but with banal poison. In the morning, however, Oppenheimer comes to his senses and runs back to the classroom in time to retrieve the apple. Blackett introduces him to Nielsen Bohr, Nobel Prize winner, and the mustache-shaving face of Hercule Poirot, who nearly takes a bite out of the apple. Bohr advises him to change universities to better fulfill his potential. Heeding the advice, the student moves to Germany's Göttingen under Max Born's wing, where he immerses himself in the spiderwebs of quantum physics and with madness. The story switches to Louis Strauss, who five years later is preparing for his confirmation. He is questioned about his acquaintance and collaboration with Oppenheimer. As a simple businessman, Strauss is somewhat offended by the condescension of Oppenheimer, who prefers his society to Einstein's company on the pond. After completing his studies at Göttingen and earning a science degree, Oppenheimer lectures on quantum physics in German. He also attends a lecture by his colleague Heisenberg, after whom a drug maker would later be named. In the course of a brief conversation, it is revealed that Oppenheimer is returning to the United States. He is nostalgic and needs to promote quantum physics there. After gaining the mantle of professor, the physicist meets Ernest Lawrence, who once pharmacized drugs from a trunk. The sophomore became an outstanding scientist and builds the world's first cyclotron. His first lesson Oppenheimer learned in school, he no longer knows what it is. Oppenheimer teaches it to one single student, but soon word of mouth does its work and the classroom is filled with new listeners. At the hearing, it turns out that on the orders of FBI head Hoover, the dossier on Oppenheimer began to be collected before the outbreak of World War II because of his political views. The physicist's social circle shares the view that the American government sympathizes with fascists in spite of socialists. That's when he meets Gene Tatlock, a member of the Communist Party USA, who is under surveillance by the authorities. A spark runs between them, burning distance and clothing. The relationship between them does not go smoothly. Problems on the personal front are compounded by science news. The Germans have succeeded in splitting a uranium nucleus that Oppenheimer himself thought impossible. The theoretical justification of this process leads him to think of a chain reaction that could be used in a bomb. An article about this comes out of the book, Profit. It runs through September 1st, 1939. But the scientist's success is overshadowed by another piece of news from Germany. Poland has failed. At the hearing, Oppenheimer admits that the neutrality of the communists after the outbreak of World War II caused him to abandon his sympathies for them, despite the fact that his wife Kitty was a member of the Communist Party. Despite his dating and romantic relationship with Kitty, he did not stop socializing with Jean, who suffered from mood swings. The communist sentiments of the students are not much to the liking of the teaching staff, who subject political opponents to persecution by decree from above. Lawrence hints to Oppenheimer that he is already under surveillance. This fact comes up at the Strauss hearing. The council wonders why, knowing about the political views of the physicist, offered him to head the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. After the birth of his firstborn child, Oppenheimer's family life is somewhat complicated, forcing him even to give up his new position in favor of a colleague. Scientists plan to engage in the development of the atomic bomb to get ahead of the Nazis in this endeavor. 
Having cured her alcoholism with a horseback ride, Kitty convinces her spouse to return to the case. Without him, the others will fail. Soon, Oppenheimer is visited by General Groffs, a man who knows firsthand the price of saving soldiers on the fields of World War II. He offers the scientist to head the Manhattan Project until Heisenberg and the Nazis are blamed. The physicist agrees and immediately begins planning how to set things up. For this purpose, a special laboratory is built in Los Alamos, in the state of New Mexico, remote from human eyes. At the same time, he pairs up with a general to drive around the country and recruit talented scientists for the job. Sometime later, perhaps 28 days later, the team arrives at the laboratory under construction. However, some of them are tormented by moral and ethical questions whether they have the right to create weapons of mass destruction that are bound to hurt the innocent. However, the very first meeting of the project participants for discussion exposes another serious problem in the calculations. Told to double-check them again, Oppenheimer heeds to Einstein for a consultation. It is feared that an explosion caused by the decay of uranium could set off a chain reaction, so powerful and uncontrollable. However, fear of the Nazis proves stronger than fears of man-made Armageddon. A boon repeated calculations give a probability close to zero. Soon old friends hint to the scientist that it would be a good idea to help the communist comrades by leaking them some information. Oppenheimer refuses and reports back to the hearing. This information is also relevant to the Strauss case. If the scientist leaked something, he'll be accused of complicity. He needs witnesses that the physicist did not pass secret information to outsiders although it has long been known that the Soviet Union has its own atomic bombs. At a meeting at Los Alamos, Oppenheimer tells the audience about Halifax, where the most powerful explosion in history at that time. Discussing the theory of the atomic explosion, one of his colleagues immediately suggests the next step, the hydrogen bomb, which, however, is still based on the atomic bomb. In the meantime, Colonel Groffs visits the base to remind that the information is secret and it must be guarded more carefully, divide and conquer, so that the employee does not know what his colleagues are doing. This is the only way to keep things secret, but it is contrary to the practice of general discussions practiced by experience. During the development of the bomb, Oppenheimer visits Chicago, where experimenters have succeeded in creating a self-sustaining chain reaction. The trip does not escape Groff's attention. His reprimand becomes the reason for the departure of one of the scientists unwilling to work under such pressure. At the hearing, however, Groffs expresses his belief that Oppenheimer did not pass classified data to the Soviets, even though he himself saw his team violate security protocols. One of Oppenheimer's former colleagues openly supports the communists. Any Asuki agent with him was automatically labeled unreliable by the authorities while his wife is babysitting. Information about these meetings makes Kitty promptly leave, leaving her cheating husband without moral support at the hearing. Oppenheimer is interrogated by Boris Pash, a Russian-born counterintelligence officer in charge of Manhattan Sea Security. He believes that the scientist is a secret communist, but the physicist himself, who has been tried more than once, feeds him a half-hinted theory about a secret network of spies theoretically capable of gaining his trust. Oppenheimer relates the case to Groffs, who eventually sends Posh to Europe to do intelligence work there, thus safeguarding the project from undue attention from the authorities. At Christmas, Groffs brings Niels Bohr to visit the scientists. He gets acquainted with the team's calculations and, in the process, gives out a good idea that could push the work further. He also warns Oppenheimer that the creation of weapons of such power cannot so much save the world as destroy it, and it will be on his conscience. This is when Oppenheimer is informed of Jean Tatlock's suicide. She took some pills and drowned herself in the bathtub just to be sure. At least, that's how it looks. Worried about his first love, the scientist goes ahead into the woods, where he is found shivering with cold by his lawful wife Kitty but it's necessary to continue the work, even though discord and vacillation wanders among the team. 
One of the employees even leaves, unable to put up with the atmosphere within the team. Edward Teller keeps running with the idea of a hydrogen bomb, which still requires a working atomic bomb. His ideas are even brought to the politicians for discussion. By this time it is clear that fascism in Europe is living to the last, and in the last days of the Yankees are now the main threat to the Russians, and to pacify them, you need a bigger bomb. Oppenheimer believes that the creation of such an ultimatum weapon will force the Soviets with Takhanov's pace to prepare a worthy response, copying the technology. The scientist gets acquainted with Borden, who will later write a detailed report, accusing him of sabotage in the development of the bomb, in which he was assisted by the physicist's personal file, leaked by ill-wishers from the military department. Oppenheimer himself speaks to the students, justifying the potential use of the atomic bomb for the sake of world peace, under the careful guidance of the United States, of course. Groffs and Oppenheimer prepare for the first test of the atomic bomb, codenamed Trinity. Before that, the team tests the fuse and calculates the power to designate a safe distance for observation. At the same time, the Ministry of Defense is already discussing the nuclear bombing of Tokyo. The discussion moves smoothly from the bomb will save soldiers' lives to after the war we need more bombs to resist the Soviets. The decision is made to test the bomb in July of 45, a few days before the planned Potsdam conference, so that Truman would have something to show off to Stalin. Oppenheimer's team speeds up preparations, setting up observation points and assembling the prototype. The bomb, assembled on site, is hoisted onto a steel tower. The day before, Oppenheimer leaves home and sets out for the test. He personally goes up to the secured bomb to realize the magnitude of what is to come, then waits with the others in a camp nearby for the beginning. The explosion is scheduled for half past six on the morning of July 16th. The physicist and the general spend a sleepless night in the bunker, worried that the chain reaction could, in theory, destroy the entire world. In the morning, before dawn, a signal flare cuts through the MGLU, a sign that the test is 20 minutes away. Scientists and military personnel take their places in observation stations. A timer counts down the final seconds, ratcheting up the tension. Then an incredibly bright blinding flash illuminates the night, followed by a huge, shimmering mushroom of fire. Then a shockwave reaches the observation posts, followed by a wave of cheering. The test was a success. The team welcomes Oppenheimer as a hero, never tiring of applause and congratulations. After the test, the military builds new bomb samples for use in field tests on Japanese test subjects. The scientist learns from the general that Truman only hinted to Stalin about the existence of a powerful new weapon. Looking at the trucks, Oppenheimer begins to be tormented by moral questions about the permissible possibility of using such weapons against civilians. Later, on the radio, he listens to the president's speech about the bombing of Hiroshima. The military are jubilant, for the surrender of Japan is just around the corner, and with it, the final end of the war. Oppenheimer does not share the general jubilation, feeling responsible for many deaths, but also suffers not too much, more for the sake of appearances, combining the experience with a speech to the team. Except that fleeting visions overshadow the momentous day, his photo adorns the cover of Time magazine, and President Truman honors the scientist with an audience. As a seasoned arms dealer, the president raves about Oppenheimer. However, when the scientist suggests international cooperation in atomic energy, Mr. Zork objects that the Soviets will never have such a bomb, so now the U.S. can command the parade. But if the Soviets do have a chance to respond with something, the U.S. needs to continue to develop atomic weapons. Frustrated by Oppenheimer's pacifism, Truman ends the meeting. At the hearing, it is revealed that Oppenheimer's further work was to limit U.S. nuclear capability within reasonable limits and not to pursue a hydrogen bomb. This leads to a conflict of interest with Strauss, 
Using his connections, the latter subjects the scientists' relatives and friends to reprisals. It turns out that in the Manhattan Project were recruited by the councils of agents who transmit data. Suspicions are aggravated by Oppenheimer's own speech, calling on the authorities to open dialogue. Faced with photographs of the aftermath of the atomic strike, the scientist again plunges into reflection. Teller hints that World War II has smoothly turned into a Cold War with the USSR and asks his boss to get involved in the creation of a hydrogen bomb, but he is adamant. During the hearing of the case of Strauss, a candidate for the post of Minister of Commerce, the unpleasant facts of his enmity with Oppenheimer, whom he has long put a stick in the wheels. It was Strauss, using the physicist's connection to the communists, organized a closed and biased hearing on security, damaging his reputation and nerves. Many of Oppenheimer's colleagues were summoned to the event in order to obtain testimony that would serve as an owl on the globe of the necessary verdict. Dr. Hill is called as a witness. He takes the liberty of speaking for himself, for the majority of the country's scientists and is a royal nightingale against the appointment of Strauss as minister. The reason for this is not concern for the security of the country, as the politician imagined, but personal motives, because of which he organized the repression against Oppenheimer. And if he could destroy the reputation of such a man, then he's going to destroy the reputation of ordinary scientists. Based on this testimony, the committee decides to deny Strauss a ministerial appointment. Among those rejected are the young Senator John Reynold, as well as the mastermind John Kennedy, who did not like the way Oppenheimer was treated. The film ends with a scene where the elderly Oppenheimer is presented by the president with an award for his achievements in the energy industry, recognizing his service to the country.